mantra three times. Tayanta Mune Mune Maha Munae Swaha Tayata Mune Mune Maha Munae Swaha Tayata Mune Maha Munaya Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so verse five goes on to in, in another uh, scenario, which perhaps could be even more difficult um, because it's relating to people we know. You know, in verse four is talking about people, you know, some very rare people we meet who may be extremely negative or exp experiencing a great deal of suffering. But verse five is talking about um, when we when we're dealing with someone we are friendly with. So again, we think um, we, one one has to have that mindset, thinking that um, that just as Langri Tungpa thought, um, we should think that you know my self cherishing is incredibly harmful. For, to myself and others is the greatest obstacle to generating bodhicitta and therefore the greatest obstacle for me being able to be of real benefit to kind suffering mother sentient beings therefore when out of envy and so i need to really overcome my self-cherishing thought therefore when out of envy others mistreat me with abuse insults or the like i shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. So again, I, so again, these people. Sorry, I made a mistake. The next verse is about people we know. In this verse, it's people. The people may not be people we are particularly close to or know well, but somehow um, <clears throat> they uh, mistreat me. So uh, in the previous one about number four. These people are very negative or suffering, but they're not necessarily attacking me in some way, harming me. But in this case, it gives the example when out of envy, others are mistreating me by abusing me, insulting me and, and so on, causing harm to me in various ways. I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. So, of course, um, Langri Tampa gives the example of the people doing these negative things to oneself out of envy. But of course, it could be, you know, the motivation could be any anything else. It could be out of, of pride or jealous um, uh, attachment or um, some kind of ignorance. It doesn't, you, <laughs> we shouldn't restrict our behavior of overcoming the self-cherishing thought only with people who, um, are envious of me, right? It could be for any reason. So, um, so when anyway, when we ourselves are insulted, abused, or harmed in any in any way, um, belittled, and, and for example, someone says something we we we've done is wrong, what I've said is wrong, was given the wrong information, that's not correct. The, the self-cherishing response is instantly to reject that, no, I'm right, you're wrong, right? That's the self-cherishing response, our pride, which is again, like a manifestation of our, um, of our self-cherishing, uh, doesn't like to be belittled and insulted. We have to, we feel, we have to ask, assert ourselves, right? Um, because, um, yeah, any, you know, we have this wrong view of self and 
uh, which doesn't, uh, the self that does exist arises depending on many, many factors. But um, uh, we, we are grasping in a belief that there is this self, this real me that doesn't really depend on anything. But such that, that me doesn't e exist at all. The me that is existing is changing moment by moment. But um, the job of the self-cherishing thought is it's always trying to bolster this sense of I that we're grasping at that, that is false, but we're grasping at this real me and, and where the self-cherishing thought is trying to make that sense of I feel really strong and secure and solid and comfortable and protected. So when someone attacks us, you know, um, and, and says, oh, you're wrong, you're ugly, or you're this, you're that, you're stupid, then the, the, the sense of I, it, it gets, you know, uh, diminished. And the self-cherishing thought, you know, you know, can't stand that. It, it has to reestablish this sense of I that is so important, so, so, um, yeah, special. And so we react. We have to prove I'm right, that, uh, you, you know, the other person is wrong and so on. So Langri Tampa is saying, then uh, this is a perfect opportunity to not follow the self-cherishing thought, to not follow that old behavior, and instead just let the person say what, you know, go um, behave the way they are. This doesn't mean you know, we should let people beat us up and everything, but especially this is like, this is mainly talking about verbal abuse and so on. Um, so oh, really, if, if we analyze it, these words are just sounds, they can't really hurt us. It's our, the way our self cherishing interprets those words. That is what hurts us. Yeah. It's just some, someone saying you're ugly doesn't make, make you ugly. Saying someone, someone's saying you're stupid doesn't make you stupid. Saying someone, someone saying you're wrong doesn't make you wrong. But the self-cherishing thought, you know, everything you know, becomes concrete and inherently existing. And those words seem to have such power to weaken us which we can't stand, but actually they're not really doing anything to us. You know, it's, it's our way of thinking about them that is doing something to us. So, um, and what it's doing is harming us. It's, it's, it's creating the situation where pride or jealousy or anger or a combination of all those things can arise which can then lead to all sorts of negative behavior and so on with terrible consequences. But at the very least, what it's doing is just reinforcing our self-cherishing behavior. So it's, this, it's a, this incredible opportunity to not follow that behavior. And, um, and as it says, give the victory others to even allow, you know, say, oh, you're right. Oh, you know, even, even though you know you are correct, you didn't make a mistake, you are correct, then rather than having to prove that, but following the self-cherishing thought, you just let it go and say, okay, you're right, you know, I'm wrong. Yeah. So this is so contrary to the self-cherishing thought. It's a very painful thought to the self-cherishing thought to do that. The, you know, the worldly mind says that is ridiculous to do because then people will think badly of you. They, think you, they will think you're a liar. They, they will, people, you'll get a bad reputation, blah, blah, blah. And that all may be true. But you know, the point is that Langri Tangpa 
was a great practitioner. So for him, it was okay whether people admired him or, uh, or disrespected him. It was, it was all the same. And in fact, the, the fact that people would dislike him in, from one, one sense was good because it was contrary to a self-cherishing thought that wants to be liked, you know, always liked and always praised and always accepted. So, of course, for us to do that is very, very difficult. So in, in applying the, these, um, again, we can, what, what I was trying to say yesterday is it's so important to um, develop like genuine admiration for uh, what these verses are aiming to, to do. Yeah. But we can recognize I'm not capable of that. My self cherishing is too strong. Yeah. So we have to you know, combine this practice with some wisdom and recognize where we're at and to what extent we can practice it. But with the aim that how wonderful it would be if I could in every situation practice like that and give the victory to others. Not to be concerned about my reputation, not to be concerned about whether I'm right or wrong, whatever. Not to be under the control of the self-cherishing thought. Of course, there may be situations where um, what the other person is saying and, and accusing me of can have, you know, um, affect a lot of people and therefore it may be necessary to contradict them and prove they're wrong. But in many situations in our life, it's just a very personal thing where someone, you know, insults us and but we feel that we have to insult back and whatever. So those, those situations, for sure, we can try to... Um, to um, give the victory to others, even simple things like, um, you know, uh, very very simple things like you, you're having a conversation with some somebody, and you say the capital of the country of so and so, you know, such and such a country is such and such. That's the capital, and um, the other person says, no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> Such, this other city is the capital, and then you have an argument. Oh, I'm right. I do know. And but if, if you know that that is the capital, you know it's okay. And he, the other person says it's something else. The capital of Spain is uh, I don't know, Valencia. Um, then you, you just, okay, you're right. That's not a big. You know, that argument is is so of little consequence. It has no effect on anybody or anything other than two egos fighting. So in that kind of situation, at least we should be able to try and say, okay, you're right. And let them believe that uh, so-and-so is the capital. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And from doing things like that, we can progress to something that's maybe more significant in some ways that, you know, I mean, there is the story, um, that um, uh, in, in a little book called Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, about it was um, of, of Japanese Buddhist stories about a, a monk who um, was very popular in the village where he lived and everyone praised him and everything. But then one day uh, this, this young woman um, became pregnant and she um, claimed that this, this monk was um, was the father so uh, I'm, uh, actually sorry i missed a crucial point so when everyone praised him he would just say aha uh -huh. and then this on this situation this woman accused him of being the father of her child and so everyone turned against him and said oh you're a terrible disgusting monk blah 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 and he just said aha uh -huh. <laughs> didn't disagree he just said aha uh -huh. And then he was kicked out of the village and he suffered for many years. And then after many years, um, the woman um, felt great guilt about what she had accused the monk of and confessed to the villagers that uh, the monk wasn't the father. 
So they brought him back to the village and praised him and said how wonderful he was, what a great monk, how patient and persevering. And he said, "Uh uh-huh. It just didn't matter to him one way or another when he was praised, insulted, whether he was right or wrong, it was okay. Yeah. So it's very difficult for us to practice like that, but that's the aim. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be like that? Yeah. Wouldn't it? I hope you think it would be wonderful. We would be so free, yeah, so free then. Not so much trapped by our, our self-cherishing. So, um, so again, when we meditate on this, you know, again, we're visualizing the Buddha or the, the Buddha, the Guru Buddha on our crown, sending blissful white light and nectar, eliminating all obstacles um, to being able to do this, such as our fear of having a bad reputation and so on, our pride, whatever. And then golden light and nectar coming, blessing our mind to be able to actually practice like this. So then, <clears throat> so then the next verse goes on to say, so this is an example, again, perhaps even a little bit more difficult because this is about um, someone we've trusted, we, who we know and we've put a lot of trust in. So again, thinking, you know, when Lung uh, Tungpa wrote this and practiced it, he practiced it with a thought, recognizing how harmful the self-cherishing thought was, wanting to be free of it, so he could cherish others more than self. Then with that thought, he said, when someone whom I have benefited and in, and in whom I have great hopes gives me terrible harm, I should regard that person as my holy guru. So this is an example where, you know, you have a, a, a strong friendship with someone, you've helped them a lot, you've given them a lot of benefit in some way. Therefore, just naturally, because of, you know, we human beings are, you know, fall under the control of the self-cherishing thought, we expect to be, to be treated uh, kindly by someone who's been benefited by ourselves. We've been kind to them. We expect them to be kind to us. Um, but, but what happens is this person gives terrible harm, not just a little bit of harm, but terrible harm. So this is like the greatest attack, you know, the, the most, the, what, what we, especially under the thought of the self-cherishing, find most unbearable, that someone should harm me, give me great harm after I've given them a lot of benefit. So in, in that situation, the self-cherishing thought could you know, react in a really very negative way of getting extremely angry and causing, you know, lashing out at that person in all sorts of ways, verbally, even physically, which could have all sorts of terrible consequences. So Lung Ritanka's solution to dealing with such a, a really heavy situation is um, to regard that person as one's guru, as the holy guru. Because you know, the, the job of the guru ultimately is, um, is to eliminate our self-cherishing and to eliminate our self-grasping ignorance. Yeah. And, and that is done to some extent, or many ways that is done. But one thing is that it's done by uh, directly pointing out our, our faults, you know, really strongly. 
know, if, if, if an ordinary person points out our points out points out our faults, then we find it difficult to take. But if we've established the correct relationship with the guru and we trust the guru and the guru has the right qualities, then it's possible for the guru to then really come down on our self-cherishing thought and our ego and, self, and, and selfishness and so on. Uh, and so one can think, so, but the guru, of course, does it out of great wisdom and great compassion. In this case, this person is doing, out, doing it out of a negative mind, but the result can be the same. It's point, the, the, this person is reacting in a ne negative way, causing my self-cherishing thought to arise very strongly and, and um, really showing how harmful my self-cherishing is. So this is something good in a sense, as it for a Dharma practitioner who's able to really maintain some mindfulness of, of the actual situation from a Dharma point of view, this is very helpful. So in that way, one can see this negative person who's like the friend who has become an enemy as, as the guru. They're doing the same job as the guru. So I noticed when um, Keshela came into the room, I wasn't aware at first that that's what had happened. And I saw all these people, uh, you know, prostrating and, and getting all emotional and things because everyone loves to see the guru. Um, and uh, yeah, so when you see, when you see the guru, you accept what the guru says if you have genuine devotion, yeah. And 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 one doesn't react in a negative way. One can actually appreciate any criticism the the guru gives as the best teachings. This is the way uh, Milarepa responded to the treatment he received from Marpa. Marpa for many years. Treat, from an outs from an external point of view, treated Milarepa really badly. Wouldn't teach, give him any teachings, and only gave him all sorts of terrible, painful things to do. And then, having done them, you know, Marpa said, "I never told you to do that. Why'd you do that?" Ne never gave him any praise, only criticism, and hard, you know, hard hardships. But Milarepa, having perfect guru devotion, accepted this and as a result was able to completely purify his mind and achieve enlightenment. So in a sense, the, the enemy, especially the enemy who was the friend, which is you know, the, <laughs> the worst kind of enemy, the friend who becomes an enemy, um, so that we don't generate hatred towards them, which harms us much more than our hatred harms the enemy, then the, the, we train to see that person as the guru, acting like the guru, therefore is the guru. One could even take it to, uh, you know, if, one, if one has an actual guru and one has a strong faith in the qualities of the guru. One could even think that this person uh, who's behaving so badly towards me is actually a manifestation of my guru. My guru is manifesting as this person to teach me something, yeah, to, to, to destroy my self-cherishing thought. So how kind this person is. Yeah. So it's called, of course, it's very easy for me to say these things, to practice them is very difficult, but it's important to see the, the benefit of practicing this way to, to develop you know, admiration for being able to practice, for those who actually can practice this way, have practiced in this way in the past. And we can pray 
may I be able to do this, you know, and make heartfelt requests to the Guru Buddha and think of the Guru on the crown of your head, sending white light and nectar, eliminating all the obstacles to being able to practice like that. And then sending golden light and nectar, blessing the mind to have the courage and wisdom and so on to be able to engage in that practice, seeing its great benefits. So, um, oh, okay. Right. So verse seven goes on to say, uh, so the first three, the first two verses um, establish the practice of cherishing others, cherishing them more than self uh, by giving up the self-cherishing thought. Um, verse three you know, points out the essential method, key tool in that process, which is, which is guarding the mind through strong mindfulness and introspection confronting the self-cherishing thought and all its manifestations as soon as it arises and averting it without delay. And then it goes on in the next three verses to give some examples of how to practice, you know, really strong example, you know, strong examples of how to practice of letting go of the self-cherishing thought and cherishing the other. And, and, and so now seven, verses seven and eight really sort of summarize the whole practice again by saying, um, again, recognizing how harmful the self-cherishing thought is to myself and others, then in short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers. I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. So, so uh, as most people know, what this is referring to is doing the practice of Tonglen, of giving and taking, because the more we uh, um, work on practicing, putting into, into practice in our life, the, the, the meaning of the, the first six verses, which is about uh, letting go of oneself, cherishing and cherishing others. The more we do that, we come to the point where we will want to and we'll start to be able to exchange ourselves with others. So in Shantideva's Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life, it's in verse, um, sorry, not verse, chapter eight, uh, that chapter talks about uh, how how to exchange self with others. Um, it mainly gives the like the intellectual or philosophical underpinning of how to ex exchange, you know, what exchanging self with others involves, how one can do it. But then the practice of Tonglen is a, an experiential way of doing it. It's not a, a yeah, it's a, a way to directly uh, exchange oneself with others. So this is said to be an extremely powerful method. And uh, what it's all about um, is um, again, what it's about is. It's a, a meditation practice in order that helps us um, to reduce, destroy, minimize our self-cherishing and to replace it with cherishing others more and more. And at the same time, um, it, inv uh, it involves help. It helps us to develop uh, genuine compassion for the suffering of others and also love, wishing them happiness. So it's a, it's a really wonderful 
practice. Uh, but when, uh, in the, the common, Lama Sopa Rinpoche has explained it many times, and in, in a teaching um, that His Holiness gave many years, where he explained the practice, he made the point that it should be done really strongly. You know, you don't sort of do a sort of fairy floss version of it. Do you know what fairy floss is, Paloma? <laughs> I have an idea. Yes, candy, I have an candy, idea. Sh candy See, sugar can stuff. Yeah, um, something sort of weak and sweet and whatever. It should be because the whole idea it, it, um, it, when we're doing it is we're really trying to directly attack our self-cherishing thought, make it suffer, squash it, <laughs> and. And, and, and eliminate it so that uh, the, the more positive, compassionate, wise aspect of our mind can manifest, which can then give to others. Um, yeah. So, um, so to do this practice properly, the, 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 the meditation itself is very simple, um, but to really be able to do it properly, it, where, where it really has a, a genuine effect is, is not so simple. But again, we can try through the power of familiarity. Intentar por el poder de la familiaridad. It, it can be, Puede um, ser. we can do it. Podemos hacerlo. Uh, I, I, I can hear you, Paloma. In Spanish. Here in the English channel. Are we right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so basically, as most many people here already know, what uh, Tonglen practice involves is where we imagine taking the suffering from others and and putting the suffering on ourself, or not on ourself as such, but on the self-cherishing thought, imagining the self-cherishing thought sort of suffering and uh, suffocating under that and, and, and therefore being destroyed. And we imagine that uh, the true nature of our mind then manifests. And from that very positive state, when we breathe out, we imagine breathing out all our good qualities and happiness and Dharma understanding and merits and giving it to others, uh, imagining them being becoming more and more joyful, developing all Dharma qualities and so on, until perhaps even enlightenment is achieved. So, of course, this is only done at the level of imagination. In reality, we can't take suffering from others and we can't give them happiness. We can't transfer our, for example, our positive karmic imprints to other sentient beings. We can't transfer our understanding of the Dharma like directly into the mind of another person. But nevertheless, it, it is very significant for our mind to imagine really strongly that we actually can do it. Yeah, and, and that's one of the key things that we have to somehow try to, uh, you know, get into a mind state where we are imagining that we are re actually, we're not just imagining, but we are actually taking, we are just imagining, but we have to try and forget that we're imagining taking the suffering and, and get into a mind state where it feels like we are actually taking the suffering of others and we are actually giving our happiness and good qualities and, and merits to others. Yeah. So the more we can do that, the more powerful it is. But the, the thing to understand is that how it works is, or what it's trying to do, is that if we think about it, the self-cherishing the, the self thought doesn't even want to know about our own suffering, right? 
as soon as we become aware of our suffering, instead of dealing with it, I mean, especially as an ordinary person, instead of dealing with it properly, we our, the self-cherishing solution is to distract ourselves from it. Yeah, and especially, as I said, quickly and easily. And, and so we don't even want to know about our own suffering and feel it and recognize it and how bad it is and our potential for suffering in cyclic existence. We're our, you know, part of our mind fortunately does, our Dharma side, our wisdom side acknowledges it to some extent, but then the self-cherishing comes along and says, no, 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 you know, everything's fine, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. A piece of chocolate or a, you know, a movie will solve the whole problem or just another love affair or something like that. Then I'll be okay. Samsara is wonderful. It's not that bad. I'm sure the Buddha doesn't really mean that, what he says about how bad samsara is. No, no, it's, it's okay. I'll, I'm okay in samsara. That's the self-cherishing thought. So we don't even want to know about our own suffering, let alone the suffering of others, right? So the whole aim of this practice is to imagine the suffering of others really strongly and, and, then, and then taking it from that person or people and experiencing it oneself so they don't have to. So we're, do, we're doing the very opposite to what the self-cherishing thought wants. The self oh, does, yeah. The, the self-cherishing does not want to experience suffering, so we make it experience suffering, right? And also the, the very thing that the self-cherishing thought cannot bear is to give our happiness to others, to give our possessions to others. You know, the self-cherishing thought is never satisfied with what it's got. It has to have more and more. I can't give anything away because then I'll be happy or I might suffer. I might need this. 20, you know, this beggar wants this thing, but I can't give it to them because I need it. Well, I may not need it now, but in 20 years I might need it, so I've got to keep it. Yeah? I'm, I'm giving exaggerated examples, sorry, but anyway, just to make the point. Yeah. So... so the, the self-cherishing thought cannot bear giving away things. So, but then the other aspect of this practice is we imagine not yet giving our happiness, not sharing it, giving a little bit. The idea is to imagine giving away all our happiness, all our Dharma understanding, all our merits to others. The very opposite to what the self-cherishing thought wants. In other words, we, you do it to freak out the self-cherishing thought. Yeah. So if, the self if you're doing the meditation and your self-cherishing isn't freaking out, it's not working. But that's okay. When through the power of familiarity, at some point, we will, it will work. Yeah. Or more and more strongly. Now, in order to do this, one, one thing that is very important to understand is because this could sound like the whole idea, this meditation of taking on other people's suffering and giving away our, ha our happiness to others, sounds like, oh, this meditation is designed to make me utterly miserable and to punish me, yeah, I'm being, I have to, because I'm self-cherishing, I have to punish myself by taking on all this suffering and giving away all my happiness. It may look like that, but this is not what it is about at all. So it's really important to understand that it's about harming the self-cherishing thought. And we, we all have this self-cherishing thought, but what we have to understand to do this practice properly so it doesn't become something harmful 
to our mind, what we have to understand you know, really clearly is that although we have the self-cherishing thought, it is, that is not me. It is not an integral part of me. It is there with my mind. It is obscuring my mind, but it is not a true aspect of my mind. Yeah. So we're not trying to punish me and make me miserable. Quite the opposite, because if we can even reduce, however much we can reduce our self cherishing thought, that much more we will experience peace of mind, happiness, joy, comfort, well-being, whatever you want to call it. The self-cherishing thought is the source of all our suffering. We're trying to eliminate the source of all our suffering so we can be happy. And, but more than so that we can be happy, but in from that joyful state, we can have endless energy to benefit others, right? That's, that is a key thing to understand. We, you know, we have to accept that we have self-cherishing, but it's not me. It's not an integral part of me and my mind. It is what is suffocating my mind. It is suffocating my true nature, my true potential, my Buddha nature, my Buddha potential. Yeah. So in order to do this practice, it, it, it depends, it, in a sense, it requires some compassion and loving kindness for ourselves and others, but it's also a way to cultivate more love and compassion because the taking of suffering from others, of course, is the practice of compassion, helps build compassion. And the giving of our good qualities and happiness to others is the practice of loving kindness in a very powerful way, especially if we can do it, as I said, that we, we're feeling, you know, we're, that we are actually are giving our love, uh, our good qualities to others. We actually are taking it from others. So as I said, Although in reality we can't take suffering and we can't give happiness, but we but it's still meaningful to imagine this very strongly. What it, it um, by doing this uh, uh, at the level of imagination, it is nevertheless changing our mind, putting these incredibly positive imprints in our mind, so that we will you know we. We will be, we'll, our love and compassion will increase, and in the future, and, our, and, and it's diminishing our self cherishing. And they, um, it's a very active way to put imprints of cherishing others more than self into our mind stream. So uh, it's creating the cause for us to uh, help sentient beings be actually free of suffering in the future. Yeah. It, it, it's creating the cause for us to be able to actually help them experience peerless everlasting happiness. So um, the way this is done, as most people are probably here already know, uh, one imagines, the, thinks about uh, the suffering of uh, others uh, first and until it becomes unbearable. And then you imagine taking that suffering from them, the suffering and its causes, all of it, you're extracting it from them. And you do that by imagining that their suffering and the causes of their suffering uh, is this you know, really ugly, thick smoke that you breathe in. And as you breathe in, 
you imagine this is suffocating the self-cherishing thought, which Rinpoche, Lama Sobha Rinpoche says, is you could imagine as something like this, like, um, like this cold, solid rock over your heart. And as you breathe in the smoke, that, that self-cherishing thought is suffocated and shattered, eliminated, because it can't bear that suffering. And then, and then that sort of, you imagine that um, liberates the, your pure mind. And from that, that pure mind, then you, as you breathe out, you imagine breathing out this blissful white light that is the embodiment of all your good qualities, understanding, you know, calm, good karmic imprints, which you breathe into the, the beings you've taken suffering from. And you imagine these beings, you know, becoming more and more joyful, more wise, more compassionate, developing all Dharma qualities and so on. So one does that step by step. You take the suffering, give happiness. Yeah. Like that. And um, the, 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 the way Tonglen is, is, is taught is that you imagine taking on all the suffering from all sentient beings onto yourself, cherishing, and then giving all your happiness, etc., to all sentient beings. But it's not really wise, you know, for this practice to be of any real benefit it's, it's not very skillful to start the practice in that way of imagining taking on all the suffering of all sentient beings onto oneself and giving all your happiness to everybody because you know we can't imagine all sentient beings we certainly can't it's difficult enough to pretend to imagine to pretend to imagine taking on the suffering of even one other person, but to imagine in one go suddenly taking on all the suffering of all sentient beings is just too much. It becomes meaningless. It becomes like a spiritual gain, spiritual materialism to do that. So in the teachings, it advises that it. Um, to train step by step by firstly working on oneself. Before you imagine taking suffering from others, you just imagine your future self. So for example, even uh, you can start by thinking about your future self of tomorrow. And like, so tomorrow is Monday, right? So many of you might have to go to work and, and various things, or so you think. What am, what 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 am I? What will I be doing tomorrow? And what sort of things about tomorrow am I not looking forward to? Sort of people I have to meet, things I have to do, whatever you know. And the the the, the little suffering that's involved in that, you know. So you think of those those actual examples. And you imagine taking on the suffering of that future me of tomorrow, that suffering that you may have to experience and put it on your self-cherishing now. Yeah. And then you imagine that destroying your self-cherishing and from that really positive state, you breathe out this love and compassion and wisdom and courage and strength and skillful means and whatever to that future me of tomorrow. So if we can reduce our self-cherishing a little bit now, there'll be less suffering tomorrow. If we can imagine our you know, breathing into our future tomorrow, future the me of to tomorrow, making that person a little bit more consciously wise and compassionate and less self-cherishing, et cetera, et cetera, then tomorrow's me will be okay. Yeah. So one can try that. 
but even perhaps more beneficial is, um, but that, that's a way to start. Okay. And, um, but one can develop that a bit more and then imagine yourself, whatever age you are now, imagine yourself 10 years older or 20 years older, depending how old you are, 30 years older than you are now. And you, you don't, it's not important to imagine what you will look like or anything like that, but you think of yourself 30, you know, 10, 20, 30 years older than you are now, having lived those years under the control of the self-cherishing thought. Yeah. 30 more years of being controlled by self-cherishing. Yeah. It's, it's quite a depressing thought. Oh, I've, I've just done it again. I've lost everyone. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're here. Uh, I know you were there. Um, so if, if I don't change my self-cherishing thought now, it's going to stay with me for far, you know, next year, the year after that, five years, 10 years, until I die. And, and think of all the suffering that comes as a result of being controlled by the self-cherishing thought, all the afflicted desire and attachment and anger and pride and jealousy and fears and worries and mistakes one's made all that time, all the negative habits that one has now, one will have been following for five more, 10, 15, 20, 30 more years of this life. Yeah. So you imagine that person and all the suffering they've gone through, that you, which is you, the future you, still controlled by self-cherishing. And then you imagine taking that on now, destroying your self-cherishing now, liberating your, your pure mind now, and breathing all of those good qualities into that future me. Yeah. That becomes really effective, very interesting, very beneficial. And you can even think of just, just think of one bad habit you have now. I'm sure we all have some bad habits. Just think of one bad habit you have now. Why do we have it? Why haven't we got rid of it? Because of self-cherishing, right? So because of self-cherishing, it's going to last tomorrow, this, the rest of this year, next year, blah, 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 blah. So imagine all the suffering due to that one bad habit that lies ahead of you. So take on all that suffering now onto the self-cherishing cult. Use it to destroy your self-cherishing now. Because if we can destroy our self-cherishing or even, even however much we weaken it now, there'll be, there won't be that much suffering in the future. So this is a really meaningful way to practice Tonglen. And having done that for some time, then one can then start doing it in relation to others. And, the, and the, the skillful way of doing that is first you start with people who are um, friends, you know, family and friends, because it's easier to imagine taking their suffering. Then when, has one, when, when one has some familiarity with that, you imagine taking from strangers, then even from enemies. And then you can extend it from just small groups to bigger and bigger. To one can at least imagine taking the, all the suffering of all sentient beings. Um, so the text, I think that's all I can say for the time about that. 
I hope that makes sense. But most people, are, I think, listening are familiar with the practice. But um, that's, that's the essential way of doing it. Um, but as I said, the idea is, as his Holden says, don't just um, do it in a very light way because it won't have any effect. The idea is to try and do it really strongly um, so that you, one, you know, is, one is, is really trying to get the sense that one is really taking this suffering, which is painful, yeah, and putting it on to the self-cherishing thought. One's not punishing oneself. One's actually trying to free one's the tr the tr the true the true na one's true nature. One's trying to yeah become free of suffering by doing this practice, free of suffering, so that one can help everyone be free of suffering. And as Langri Tanka says. Uh, to, to to practice this secretly. So, um, if I can just find the quotation, um, but um, just bear with me one second. Um, Oh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama says um, the, the, the term secretly um, can refer to the need for a certain amount of integrity on the part of the practitioner so that the practice of Tonglen is done in a discreet way and the practitioner does not become an exhibitionist. In other words, there's a danger that if you do it very publicly or let everyone know you're doing this, it, you know, it, it, instead of getting rid of the self-cherishing thought and, the, you know, the ego, it can just build it up. You know, how wonderful I am taking on this, uh, taking on the suffering of all uh, others and so on. So one does it secretly. And one can do this also in, uh, apart from you know, in meditation and thinking just in a, in a general way about, well, thinking about family and friends or then imagining all sentient beings, whatever, actually in one's daily life, whenever one sees someone in, in suffering, then one could do the practice secretly. No one knows you're doing it. The person who's suffering doesn't know. You just imagine taking on the suffering of that person or a group of people, or you see a couple of people arguing, and then you imagine taking on their suffering and the causes of their suffering onto yourself so they don't have to experience it. So now finally, um, so again, uh, one can, uh, when one's reflecting on these eight verses, imagine the guru on one's crown, sending blissful white light and nectar, purifying the mind of all the obstacles, preventing one doing this practice. In other, in, for example, one may have a, a great deal of fear of, you know, oh, oh I, don't, I don't want to experience, feel the suffering of other people. I can't bear that, so on. So imagine, you know, the mind being free of that kind of obstacle and then golden light and nectar from the guru pouring into you, blessing your mind to be able to have the, the courage, the wisdom, the skill, uh, and, the, uh, and the, 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 love, the, the love to be able to do this practice properly. So then uh, the final verse, uh, which is a sort of concludes the whole thing, says again, um, Langri Tampa thinking that 
recognizing how harmful the disturbing, the self-cherishing thought is to oneself and, and all other sentient beings wanting to be able to cherish others more than self, then that thought, he says, undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns, may I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. So the first seven of the eight verses of thought transformation or mind training are really um, emphasizing mainly the, the method aspect of the practice, whereas um, verse eight is emphasizing the wisdom aspect where it talks about perceiving all phenomena as illusory. But firstly, he says um, that it, we need to um, train the mind uh, in um, to train the mind properly for these, this practice to work the way it's meant to work. We have to do it um, with a mind that's unstained by uh, the, the, the eight worldly concerns or uh, the, the superstitious minds which are the eight worldly concerns. So the eight worldly concerns, uh, one could say is um, like summarizes, it, it encompasses how the, the gross self-cherishing thought manifests. So uh, the, the, the the self the, the gross self cherishing is only concerned about this life and, uh, and and about the suffering of this life and the pleasures of this life that, that's all it's aware of all it's really concerned about you know as a buddhist we may believe in future lives etc cetera, etc cetera, but when we're controlled by the self-cherishing thought, our mind really focuses on really being obsessed just with this life and the pleasure, the happiness of this life, the suffering of this life. And so you know, the, the, the first two of the eight worldly concerns, which one could say are the two most important because the other six are all really branches of these two essential worldly concerns. So on the one hand, there is this worldly concern which craves um, happiness. And, but the happiness that self-cherishing is craving because it's a worldly concern uh, is, um, is, is just the happiness of this life, the happiness that comes from uh, external things, relationships with people, with, with uh, possessions and food and, and, and so on, and, and uh, reputation and whatever. So uh, the, the, the traditional term for this is the eight worldly dharmas. And in so, um, because the, the word dharma literally just means phenomena or thing. So there are these eight worldly things we could, eight worldly dharmas, things we're concerned about. But instead, we could be concerned about the, the, the Buddha Dharma, practicing the Buddha Dharma, but instead, uh, under the control of the self-cherishing thought, our mind is obsessed with the eight worldly dharmas, the eight worldly concerns, the eight worldly things one of which is ordinary happiness you know when we're controlled by the self-cherishing thought we don't think of it as ordinary happiness or worldly happiness or limited happiness it just is it there's nothing else but from a dharma point of view it's just worldly happiness and what is worldly happiness it's just the suffering of change. But that's what our self-cherishing is obsessed with. 
what the first of the eight worldly concerns is obsessed with. It craves happiness, pleasure, or what it thinks of as happiness, which I try to say in many cases, all it is is anything that can distract our mind from suffering and dissatisfaction and boredom. So, but the more we follow that mind, that worldly concern of craving happiness, the more we create the very opposite mindset is that we fear suffering. The more we expect to be happy, the more we fear being unhappy, experiencing suffering. And that the more we are un the more we are unable to bear suffering. And then therefore, because of fearing suffering, we crave distraction from it. And anything can because uh, and the greater the fear of suffering and therefore the, the, the inability to bear it, whatever will distract us from that appears to our confused mind as some kind of happiness, some kind of pleasure. But the trouble is also, the more we crave happiness controlled by the self-cherishing thought, the more we will be willing to do all sorts of negative actions to get it. And the more we fear suffering, the more we will, are willing to engage in negative actions to stop it. That's how the self-cherishing thought works. We engage in all the 10 non-virtues because of that, because we fear suffering, even the tiny bite of a mosquito. So we kill the mosquito because it's the quick, easy way to deal with suffering, according to self-cherishing. And unfortunately, if our self-cherishing is very strong and our fear of suffering is very strong, then we can even kill another human being. And so, so because of you know, those two basic worldly concerns, then there, there is the craving for getting things, for having stuff, because we associate having stuff, possessions, money. We associate that with happiness. But of course, the more we follow that mind, which we've been doing since beginningless, samsara, <clears throat> the more we create the very opposite mindset, which is the fear of not having stuff, not having things, and the fear of losing the stuff that we've already got. And again, the more we crave stuff, the more we're willing to do all sorts of negative things, to lie, steal, and so on, to get it. And also, the more we fear not having stuff um, or losing what we've got, again, we're willing to do all sorts of negative actions. And then uh, there's the, the worldly concern of, of craving um, a good reputation. And the more we crave that, 
will create the opposite mindset of fearing having a bad reputation. And again, in, in both cases, we're willing in order to have a good reputation. We, we, you know, if it's, we become the self cherishing is so strong, then we're willing to do all sorts of negative actions to have a good reputation and to do all sorts of ne negative things to avoid having a bad reputation, to hide having a bad reputation, for example. You know, hide our bad qualities and, you know, and do, do all sorts of things to hide our faults and bad behavior so that we, we uh, don't lose our reputation and so on. And if you think about you know, this, this worldly concern of reputation, it's, it's all about um, you know, the reputation could be you know, wanting to be you know, incredibly famous or just liked within a small group. You know, we all have our own little groups that we're in family fr friendships and whatever and it's all, it's also really all about um, when, when we talk about reputation it's uh, not necessarily consciously having a good reputation but this worldly concern is is really about wanting to be accepted that craving to be accepted within a particular group of people. It may be a very small group. It may be a larger group. And it may be, you know, different, different groups that we mix with it. But there's that craving to be liked and acceptable. Uh, and, and, yeah, and the fear of not being acceptable and, and liked. And with that, you know, doing, saying all sorts of things which may not be very skillful to achieve those goals. Yeah. And of course, the stronger the self-cherishing, the more reckless we can be, more negative our behavior can be, harming ourselves and others ultimately. And then there is the, um, the, the worldly concerns of which is along similar lines of um, craving um, praise and fearing criticism or blame, fame and blame, praise and blame, yeah. Because again, we associate these things with happiness, it strengthens the sense of I, this is what the self-cherishing thought is all about. And the more we, you know, the more we crave praise, the more we fear criticism. And that again, the more we're willing to do anything to be praised, to be accepted, to be loved, to feel secure. And the, and the more we can be willing to do all sorts of negative things to avoid criticism, to being, avoid being rejected. So trapped in those, you know, sets of worldly concerns, um, There's, there's no chance to cherish others. It's all about me, really. And so much harm to others can, can result. So in order to practice, we, we really need to overcome these worldly concerns. This is what self-cherishing really is in a nutshell. Practically every form of self-cherishing we can think of fits into one of those eight worldly concerns.
and even so that it, pro it prevents us practicing it prevents us being able to develop love compassion the ability to cherish others to exchange ourselves with others but also even when we do try and do these things to some extent the eight worldly concerns can get in the way and make the practice imperfect that the reason we're doing it is we may think it's it's the, the, the right reason that it's really all about benefiting others but it may only, it, it may be done secretly we're trying to be accepted by a group of people to you know enhance our reputation etc cetera, etc cetera. so we need to really try and purify our mind of these worldly concerns and again the way to do that is um is to really uh, go back to verse th three and practice strong mindfulness to be able to detect these worldly concerns and oppose them as much as we can uh, there are many ways to try and oppose them again one of the essential ones is an understanding of impermanence and death that all the objects of our self of the worldly concerns are impermanent you know the happiness with the worldly happiness we crave is really just the suffering of change it doesn't last the the objects it's based on don't last the, all, all the stuff we crave is impermanent You know, reputation and praise don't last very long. So why are we wasting this precious human rebirth on these worldly concerns when we've got the optimum chance to um, practice the Dharma? And if we don't practice the Dharma in this life, and create the causes for a, another good rebirth. When are we ever going to have the chance? So very quickly, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, it goes on to say, um, not only do we, we what we need to do in practicing the uh, the eight verses of mind training is to, to, to do it with the understanding of emptiness, that everything is f free of existing the way it appears now. Everything that we experience with all our senses, everything we see, everything we hear, smell, taste, touch, everything we think about, it all appears to our mind as though it inherently exists that it's there from its own side, self-sustaining under its own power, with its own qualities. But nothing, but nothing is like that. Nothing is like that. Uh, you know, the self-cherishing thought tells us that practicing the dharma is is too hard it's too difficult and because it appears we grasp that dharma practice is inherently difficult now understanding and em emptiness is in it appears to be very difficult inherently difficult but it's not nothing exists that way everything is empty so everything is possible and we you know the self-cherishing thought itself grasps that i am this fixed truly inherently existing being yeah i can't do that i, I can't exchange myself with others I can't practice patience with this enemy, this terrible person, because everything is appearing so concretely. 
But if we use this precious human rebirth to, which gives, it gives us the greatest opportunity to begin to understand the, the way things actually ex exist, how they are empty of inherent existence. So even a little understanding of this can be incredibly beneficial. And we, we can start to see that all these things that appear so concrete are not like that. And that things are really possible that we can really change through the power of familiarity. So um, in, in the teachings, it says that when somebody uh, in, uh, on the path of, uh, when they enter the path of insight, which is when someone for the first time directly perceives emptiness in meditation. So in that state, no inherently existing thing appears in that state of deep meditation. But when the Bodhisattva comes out of that deep meditation with their ordinary awareness, everything once again appears inherently existing, but the big difference for someone on the path who is now on the path of insight is because they've directly experienced emptiness in meditation, out of meditation, things still appear to inherently exist, but the big difference in their experience is that they no longer grasp that that appearance is true. Everything appears like a dream, like an illusion. And although we may <laughs> are not on the path of insight and don't have direct experience of emptiness, one, one thing as ordinary people we can try to practice is trying to see things as like an illusion in our waking life to try to practice the mindfulness of thinking of things as being like in a dream, like an illusion. That things are not as so fixed and permanent and concrete as they appear, that they, yeah. So that can be really helpful. The more we put work into understanding that this I that we're grasping at right now that, that seems so fixed and permanent is not like that. That the I that validly exists is what is merely labeled by the mind in dependence on the mind. It is something that is what is appearing now to our mind. Rinpoche says, everything that is appearing to our mind right now is an illusion because everything appears to inherently exist, but it doesn't. There's just the illusion of inherent existence appearing to our mind. And the, and the way things actually exist, of being empty of inherent existence, of arising dependently, moment by moment, depending on causes and conditions, depending on many parts, and especially depending on the mind. That's the way things actually exist. And that, that, is, that appearance, that way of existing is like an illusion. Everything is like an illusion. It is like a dream. But because things are like, an, like illusions arising depending on many factors, if we change the factors, then the phenomena changes. 
if we perpetuate our self, if we maintain the causes of our self-cherishing, our self-cherishing will continue and it will continue to bring us suffering. But if we don't maintain the causes of our condition, if we don't maintain the causes of our self-cherishing, it, it has no power from its own side to sustain itself. And we have this method, the eight worldly, the, sorry, the eight verses to change the conditions. Another way to think about things, another way to think and behave. So I th that I've run out of time and that's it for me. Um, are we supposed to have some questions? I don't know. Is there some time for questions? Is there somehow, oh, I'm happy to answer some questions if people are not too exhausted and too cold and tired and bored. Okay, and well, we'll do a, few, a few questions. But I think is there it's... some way I can start seeing everyone again? Can you do yeah, wave hopefully. your magic there's... wand and do something? There's a couple like of ways. Did... We're on the, um, in the in the window, behind the window that you're looking at now. So if there's a way you can make that smaller. Oh, or, right. Oh, uh, I see. On the top right corner, depending whether you've got a Mac uh, or, or Windows. You know, if I could, uh, like minimize yeah. that, that window you're looking at now. I'll That's just do one. this. Yes, yes. Are we Fantastic. Back? Yay. Yes. Yay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I think that was really, really good that you... um yeah, gave the summary and gave a bit of time to emptiness, even if we don't get time to go through all the questions. I think that was, yeah, the most- Yeah, sorry about that. No, no. Got so yeah, to, quickly, yeah. Lydia has read a book and in this book, she's read a phrase. She doesn't remember which book, but in the book, the phrase goes like this. The ego needs to shine before it can be destroyed. And she goes on to ask, um what you think about this phrase is it if it, is it true and she gives a couple of possible interpretations but i think we'll just cut to the chase what do you think about this phrase well i don't know who wrote this uh but um maybe the person who wrote it meant that in order what was it it needs to shine in order to what yes basically do you need a strong ego first of all, before you can chip away at it and destroy it. That kind yes, of thing. yes. Yeah. I don't know about necessarily a strong, a strong ego, but um, I think as Hollis has made this point on a number of occasions, in order to be able to um, get rid of the ego, you have to have a, a, strong, a, a strong sense of your ego. Of, um, how to put this properly? I don't know how to put it properly. Uh, but a person, I, I'm probably not using the politically correct terminology, but someone who is mentally disturbed, has some serious mental disturbances, there, there is no way that such a person is able to eliminate the wrong view of self, yeah, to become free of self, because they don't have a strong, a clear sense of their own self. It's the mind is too disturbed. So to be able to eliminate the self, the wrong view of self, one has to have a healthy sense of self. It seems contradictory, but in, in, in other words, one has to be, have, have a, to put it a more simple way, one has to be, from a conventional point of view, sane. <laughs> what the conventional world thinks of as being sane in order to practice the Dharma and get rid of the, 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 this wrong view of self we have. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, I, I mean, maybe the, whoever was, wrote that was saying, when they were was saying shine, you have to shine a light on the eye. You have to be able to clearly have a sense of this eye that one is believing in. Yeah, thanks. That, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. So I think that's what it's referring to. Another quick question. This is yeah. not so much 
the negative emotions, for example, desire, but like the object mm. of our desire. Um, mm -hmm. So this is a question that says, so if we have a, an object of desire that causes us so much affliction, should we run away from it or face it as it will always appear and be there? Well, if, if it's actually always going to be there, then of course one needs to face it, face the object of desire as much as possible and deal with it. But that's very, very tricky. <laughs> Especially if you want to be with the object of desire, right? Yeah. But if you, if you don't want to be with the object of desire, then of course the idea should be to try and run away. <laughs> But that, that's a very tricky question because, uh, yeah, I, I, could, I could get myself into a lot of trouble answering that question, I think. Okay, thanks. So another quick question. Um, mm. So to destroy the self-cherishing thought, is it true then that to destroy the gross self-cherishing thought, we use the bodhicitta thought, the mind of bodhicitta? To, to destroy the gross self-cherishing, and then to destroy the subtle self-cherishing, the, the wisdom mind that understands emptiness? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, you can't destroy the, the gross self-cherishing thought with bodhicitta because the gross self-cherishing thought um, um, prevents you developing bodhicitta. Although um, another way, of, well, one way of one way you could say bodhicitta destroys self cherishing is the wish to, to to develop bodhicitta and the wish to see how beneficial it is, and the, um, and 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 realizing, which is what I've been trying to say, um, the more we see how beneficial cherishing others more than self it is it's beneficial for oneself and it's beneficial for others the more one sees that and the more one wants to practice it um, and the more one sees that the greatest obstacle to doing that is the self-cherishing thought then that that sets off the process where one will try to under, undermine the self-cherishing thought yeah Thanks. And you try to cherish others, yeah. And you try not to, you know, just simply, you know, not follow the self-cherishing thought. Weaken it by simply not following it. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So Maggie asks something about verse number five. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. And the other one about um, getting rid of the um, the subtle self-cherishing, which is, you know, which is in a sense um, the, the more subtle but powerful uh, obstacle to generating bodhicitta because one becomes so obsessed about just, just experiencing the bliss of nirvana. The, 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 that is the obstacle, the um, antidote to that is bodhicitta really or again that strong sense of uh wanting to repay the kindness of mother sentient beings and that's why in our tradition in the Lama Rim tradition in in the tibetan system uh certainly in the galupa tradition all our lamas when they teach they emphasize at the very beginning bodhicitta and having the bodhicitta motivation you know when we listen to the teachings when we meditate you know at the very beginning of the day we're encouraged to try and have the bodhicitta motivation we don't have bodhicitta we we have we're with all due respect just talking about myself at least a million miles away from having bodhicitta but we're encouraged to think about bodhicitta from the beginning of of, of being con even though we're not really concerned about others, we're, we're being encouraged to, to, to start developing the mind that is concerned about others, of how kind sentient beings are, 
how much suffering they are so that we, we, we don't fall into that um, path of just seeking our own nirvana. Yeah, thanks. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, last question. This is um, a question about verse number five, which starts when someone whom I've benefited. And yeah. here questions the fact that if we have this view of I'm, you know, I've benefited someone, isn't that in fact the self cherishing mind that's elevating me to a position of a big time helper? Or it's myself cherishing that in fact puts upon this person my hopes of a return for services um well it could be i mean because because long retumper is saying i have self-cherishing i want to get rid of it and therefore you know um yeah you know i i but um just, just because you, you, you know, someone says, well, I've been very kind to this person, you, you think I've been very kind to this person, that itself is not self-cherishing. You know, if you have been kind to them, you've been kind to them, and it's perfectly okay to recognise I've been kind to this person. That's okay. Okay. Last question. <laughs> this is about Tonglen. And it's basically asking, is there any sort of practical benefit of doing Tonglin if we're doing it for someone who's sick or ill? Can we actually perceive uh, something real happening, benefiting them? Um, uh, yes, yes, definitely. Oh, there's a dog. <laughs> Cat, sorry, appearing. Um, um, you know, one of the things that very common in the Tibetan tradition, as everyone knows, is doing pujas for people, for sick people. You know, Rinpoche spends an enormous, an enormous amount of time and money uh, sponsoring pujas, doing pujas himself for the benefit of others. These work, doing prayers, um, uh, can affect other people. Yeah. It doesn't actually, uh, my understanding, this is just my understanding, or it may be completely wrong, but how I make sense of it is I think, you know, um, pe people are, are experiencing the ripening of their own karma, but for karma to ripen and continue to ripen, you have to have the conditions. So doing prayers and pujas and Tonglen doesn't change the karma as such, but I, I, I think in some way it affects the conditions and therefore can reduce, at least reduce, the harmful effects of things. Um, when, when I lived at Nalanda Monastery, there was a period of time, I don't know how long it lasted, where a, a, a hospital in um, Texas, in America, which specialised in heart operations, they contacted us, and, and, but also a, a number of other uh, religious organizations, Buddhist, non-Buddhist, of all different religious dominations. They um, contacted these different groups. And when a particular operation was being conducted, uh, just before it happened, they asked the, uh, all of these religious groups to pray for the person which we did regularly at Nalanda, uh, various people. We were given the name and when they were being operated. And, but the, the people being operated were never told this. And not, not everyone who was operated was, uh, you know, uh, they were um, prayed for, you know, only some of the people. And after a period of maybe it was a year or something, um, some, a survey was done by the hospital and they said there was a very clear um, result that the people who were prayed for usually recovered much, much more quickly, uh, more with less pain, et cetera, et cetera, than people who were, who were not prayed over. Wow. Yeah. 
the power of prayer. I just lost you again. I, 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 oh, no, you're back. We're back. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, the power of prayer. So, um, so, so Tong Lin is a particularly powerful practice. So, if someone is able to, well, I mean, if you if you can do it really well, then, uh, yeah, no doubt it could have some effect. Now, of course, everything depends on the karma of the person, but. Um, I think prayers and pujas and the practice like meditations, um, which where the, you know the mind is focused in a very positive way on a person or a group of people, that can definitely affect. And Rimshe definitely says so, and there are stories you know that this is the case. And also, one can do it for oneself. Yeah. So I, okay, is that it? Yeah, I can't hear anybody now. <laughs> oh, right. Hey, just be. Yes, yes. Can I just say one thing before I go? Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you know, I, I mentioned this: how we have this huge debt to all sentient beings, and how it's all growing all the time. That can sound like something terrible. I don't mean it that way. It's just a way to uh, encourage us to repay that benefit. I'd just like to mention, say that um, at the very end of the last tour that Lama Yeshi did, uh, and soon after it, he got very sick and then manifested leaving this world. Um, at the end of that tour, Lama Yeshi gave all the people who were involved in that tour, and at that time I was Rinpoche's attendant, a book. And this is my book, The Tibetan Dharmapada. And he, his secretary, Jackie Keeley, wrote in it something, a message dictated by Lama Yeshi. And I'd just like to read um, a little bit of, the de of this dedication written by Lama Yeshi, where he says, it is a very rare opportunity to work for others. For countless lives, we have all worked for our own selfish purpose. So you people are the lucky ones to dedicate for to others. So we shouldn't think that repaying the burden of kindness of others is a burden. We are incredibly lucky to be able to do it. We are so lucky. Yeah, that's Lama Yeshi's advice which I'd like to leave you with. So thank you. I don't know if I said anything intelligent in the whole two days. If I did, that was helpful. Please uh, remember it, try to put it into practice. And I wish you all the very best with your practice. And uh, I really enjoyed this time. Um, I really thank you because it gives, it gives me a chance, gave me a chance to think about, because by trying to, giving these talks for me is the best meditations I can do for my own mind. So thank you very much. And uh, I really hope I can be in Spain one day again to meet yeah. all you lovely people, lovely people. Oh, yeah. I hope so. And I'm sure all the students, the Spanish students that are connected now will agree with me in saying that we are the lucky ones having had this weekend of teachings with you. And yeah, sincerely, I think I'd um, just like to request right here and now, if we can do it again, please. Maybe in a month or two months, but in this term oh. for the summer, or say before July, if we could get together again, please, I'd like to request another little Zoom course. Now you're an expert on the Zoom thing. <laughs> Maybe we could do another text. <laughs> yes. I'm thinking maybe another text like eight verses where we can memorize it, not too long. Maybe that uh, Lama Tsongkhapa Foundation of All Good Qualities or, or another text that you've received the transmission mm -hmm. and you think would be a useful one mm. to put into practice. So I think these teachings are, are good for people who have just met Buddhism and also for people yeah. who maybe, like myself, who've maybe been around for a, a few years but really need to just step it up a bit and put some teachings into practice and these teachings i think are, are something that we can easily kind of memorize and keep in our minds 
And so to receive inspiring teachings on these texts from someone like yourself, who manages to express it in such a way that it feels like it's something that we can do. I don't know, you have that knack of making it seem like it's possible, you know, because when, when this Holiness the Dalai Lama and Lama Zerushe teaches, you feel really inspired and great, you know, once you're, when you're sitting there with them, but then it kind of fades a bit <laughs> when you're not sitting, you know, in front of them on, the, on these high thrones. But you have this uh, knack of just sort of bringing it right down to earth down to our level and it just seems like it's possible we can do this we can start to destroy our self-cherishing so yeah right. please 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 can we request another tea another teachings uh yeah but we'll have to talk about it i have some i you know uh I'm, I'm not sure if i can do it this in this actual format of two days in a row cool. like this especially okay. once i start teaching which i do next week yeah. and i and i have other responsibilities as well but I, I would love to keep in contact with the old mob, well, yeah. sorry, with all you, this, this lovely mob of people. Oh, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll have a chat then about that. Thanks ever yeah. so much, Neil. We'd like to offer a quick uh, mandala offering. That's okay. It's a quick saji perky. Oh, okay. Just always a quick saji. There's always time for a quick saji perky, yes. <laughs> This time, this time with five catters for extra auspiciousness. Thank you very much. So maybe we can finish with hey, the, the dedication press. Yeah, please. Yeah. Gewadi and you do Lama Sange Drug your name Draw a chig young Maluba May the precious, oh sorry, Janjo Sanjo Rimboche, Marge Panam Gegyoche, Kerban Yamba Mevayam, Kone Gondu Pelma Thank you so much. Pardon? Henry Rowe. Yeah, we've got it on our screens. So here, Henry. just to pick you for all the students, sorry, here also think of uh, the long life of Neil Houston, Venerable Neil, and all of our uh, teachers and spiritual Otherwise guys. known as Tubden Dundrup. <laughs> yes, Venerable Tubden Dundrup. Long life, as well as Geshe Lam Sam, all of our teachers. Gangri Rawe Korwe Singam De Pendam De Wa Malu Chowe Shen Re Zi Wang Tenzin Yam Zo Yi Sham Be Si Te Bardo Teng Yo Chi
Okay, thanks very much, everyone. Please take care, keep safe, Thank you. protect yourself and everyone from COVID. Yeah. I'd just like to say a quick thanks to Venerable Paloma as well for her. Oh, yes. Presentation. And yes. thanks to all Fantastic. the students for connecting from all over Spain, from all the different centers, all the different cities. Thanks for joining us. It's been a really. And there are other Paloma technicians as well. And definitely for Thank our you. technician, keeping it all together. And these recordings, right. this is mainly for the Spanish people, but just for, for Paloma to translate it to them. These recordings will be available soon, the videos and the um, audios to download, as long with transcripts from, from the teachings. We'll get them to you soon. Would people in Australia be able to get them? Yeah, for sure. I'll send you the, I'll send you the link. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll have the Spanish version on one side and the English on the other. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.